The Visiting Hours by Jasper Lestrange. It is always Christmas Eve in a ghost story. Jerome K. Jerome. It was the record that went missing. If it hadn't been for that, he wouldn't have stood shouting at her in the street, screaming at her, calling her the word his mother didn't like, the word she told him never to use. But the record was the only thing that mattered. It was his connection to Mum. His sister had taken some of the ornaments and jewellery. The rest had gone to charity shops and clothes banks. Christopher had only wanted to keep that one black circle, twelve inches in diameter, with all its scratches and imperfections, imprinted with more than just music. Her dust, her breath, her fingerprints, their shared memories. Now it was gone. He had come home to find his stuff scattered carelessly in the small front yard where Bev had dumped it. There wasn't much, of course. Christopher left behind more than he took each time he moved. His worldly goods now amounted to these two cracked plastic boxes full of books, records and CDs, the suitcase and holdall crammed with clothes, and the contents of one black bin bag. The suitcase must have been unzipped when Bev had tossed it from the upstairs window, for some of his clothes had spilled out. A grey sweater, black jogging bottoms and a lone trainer strewn across the wet concrete gave the vague impression of a dead body. He couldn't care less about most of these things. It was only the record. That worn out, played to death final record of his mum's that mattered. But it wasn't anywhere to be seen. Maybe it was still in the flat? In the shouting match that followed, conducted between pavement and first floor window, Bev told him that that was everything. There was no record, and she didn't care about the stupid record, and no, he couldn't come up. It was over. She'd had enough of him. Of them. She needed someone whose ambitions went further than a cramped, rented flat and a job at an old folks' home. She needed someone who understood her. That was part of the problem, Christopher thought. He didn't understand her, and never would. Bev said she was bipolar. He thought she was a... That word again. The one his mother hated. This was happening on the week before Christmas. A terrible time, he soon discovered, to find oneself homeless. And since Bev had, this time, offered no hint at the possibility of reconciliation, that was what Christopher considered himself to be. His sister, Jocelyn, and he were on bad terms, so there was no bed there. Friends, who might at other times have volunteered a spare room, sofa, or even a floor, were all too busy fretting about accommodating their other Christmas guests to consider making house room for one more, especially one who stood six foot eight inches tall and was heavy with it. Trying landlords from the payphone in the greasy spoon proved equally fruitless. And here he was, aged thirty-two, reprising his role as Joseph in the school nativity play, finding out there really was no room at the inn. Now, as then, a stable eventually presented itself, and Pauline, his boss, became his unlikely saviour. He was down to work the day shift at Nuttree Lodge that week anyway, but a co-worker had fallen ill, and she needed Christopher to come in on Christmas and Boxing Day too. He decided he had nothing to lose and everything to gain by mentioning his present predicament, and Pauline suggested he take one of the rooms used by sleeping staff, just for a few nights until he found himself something better. In the space of a five-minute conversation then, he had not only secured temporary lodgings, but also the guarantee of a Christmas dinner and if that meant slithers of processed meat and rock-hard roast potatoes, 
drowned in Carla's watery gravy. So be it. All things considered, it was better than going hungry and spending Christmas alone. Christopher was not like some of the other staff at the care home, who seemed to actively resent the people they were employed to look after. He liked them, and sought to treat them with kindness, patience and respect, even if they were forgetful, cantankerous, sometimes rude. He liked the Northern Irish chap who always called him Big Man, and the Jamaican who high-fived him called him Brother. He liked the twinkly-eyed little old ladies, who said he reminded them of their own sons and nephews, which was unlikely, he thought. There were staff who complained of residents being deliberately difficult, of soiling themselves on purpose, of being inappropriate. But on this matter, Christopher was sanguine. These people had lived seventy, eighty, ninety years, their lives touched by war, hardship, upheaval, loss. Now they were in the waiting room, nearing the end of their lives. It always seemed to Christopher that they deserved to be cut some slack. Besides, by the time they arrived at Nut Tree Lodge, they were all so fragile, so tired. When he looked in their eyes, he saw none of the hate and scorn and pride he saw in the eyes of younger people. Only sadness and fear. Nat didn't agree. She said some of the residents were nasty, and when she spat the word in her Polish accent, he knew she meant it. You should hear what they say about you when your back's turned, she told him once. Nat was thin, brittle, careworn, but with a natural prettiness that even long working hours and meagre wages hadn't quite contrived to diminish. Her blonde hair was perpetually dishevelled, and bore traces of grey, like the grey in her eyes. Christopher thought that waiting until his back was turned showed a level of courtesy he hadn't always been afforded in life. He was bear-like in height and girth, and inclined to stoop in a way that suggested a timidity at odds with his imposing bulk. Since childhood he had been an easy target, for verbal missiles, passed off as jokes, but intended to hurt. They're all right, he said. They're just old. Nat's face was as incapable of concealing an inner thought as Christopher's was often unreadable. Not that one, she told him, pointing to Les, a recent new arrival, who had already acquired a reputation for prickliness. He sported a jet-black toupee and was presently hunched over a table, frowning at a jigsaw puzzle. Male chauvinist pig. But Christopher saw only another poor old soul, like all the others. The residents of Nut Tree Lodge were just people, some of whom had led bad lives, mean lives, and done terrible things, no doubt. But old age and failing health had the effect of mellowing a person of shrinking them, making them childlike and vulnerable. Les's ridiculous hairpiece was even more pathetic, and therefore adorable, because it was a last vestige of vanity, and a last stand against inevitable, irreversible physical decline. Christopher's mother hadn't lived long enough to experience that decline. She had died young, in her fifties, and out of the blue stroke, it had been Christopher that found her, coming home to see her, sat, slumped in her favourite armchair. Since working at the lodge, Christopher had come to be grateful that at least his mum had been spared all the drawn-out pain, suffering and indignities of old age. At the time, he had been devastated. But now, as he attended to nutry residents who cried out in pain at night, or wept as he changed their catheter bags, and sat sad-eyed in the lounge, awaiting the visitors who either came and left as soon as possible, or who simply never came. He would think of his mother. It was forever etched on his mind, that afternoon when he let himself into his mother's flat, to find it sweltering like a bakehouse, the gas fire full on, and his mum sitting in the chair, perfectly still, 
as if she was only sleeping, dozing as he had known her to do in front of the television of an evening. But he knew instantly she was dead. This woman, who had never taken a day off work for illness in her life, whose only vice was a very occasional tot of rum, dead from a stroke at fifty-seven. And he would forever remember the expression on her face. A smile, happy, sad, content, knowing, utterly peaceful. If only everyone could die that way, he thought. If only... It was the Monday before Christmas. In the lounge, since that weekend, festooned with tired-looking garlands and balding strands of tinsel, a group of local primary school children were being wrangled through a medley of carols by their increasingly distraught music teacher. This annual event was intended for the children's edification and the residents' entertainment, but a few enthusiastic old ladies accepted. Performers and audience appeared equally distracted and uncomfortable. At first it looked to Christopher as if Judy was giving the concert her full attention, but when he put the cup and saucer in her hand and crouched at the side of her chair, he realised she was elsewhere. She was gazing in the direction of the children, but there was a familiar far-off look in her small hazel eyes. Can I tempt you the biscuit, Judy? said Christopher, proffering a Tupperware box of biscuits. There's some chocolate hobnobs in there today bringing out the big guns. The old woman blinked silently, slowly, as if waking and coming to in some unexpected locale. Christopher gently placed a hand under hers to stop her from dropping her cup. Not that it could scold her, tea was always tepid. Stanley, she said drowsily. It's Christopher, he said. Christopher, she repeated. Suddenly the tiny eyes narrowed, and the gaze was fixed on him in a way that was vaguely unsettling. Is it time yet? she asked. Time for what? The visiting hours, she replied. He looked at her curiously. It was hard when they had dementia, he thought. Hard to tell if they were lucid and present in the here and now and addressing you or if they were conversing with phantoms. In his two years at Nuttree Lodge, he had heard Judy talk of visitors, but had never known her to receive one, or even a letter. Who are you expecting, Judy? he asked, as the children were reaching the end of Away in a Manger. The teacup and teaspoon rattled on the saucer in the old woman's unsteady grip. The dear little angels, she said and for a moment Christopher was perplexed. But Judy's attention was on the ragtag choir, now singing, Stay by my cradle till morning is nigh. Beautiful, aren't they? She said. Are they the same ones who came last year? The children, of course, were different every year. As sure as day turns to night, year fours go on to become year fives. But for the residents of Nuttree, and especially the likes of Judy, time was more complicated, dwelling in the past as much as the present, but each day, week, month and year, crawling at a snail's pace towards a destination that was simultaneously imminent, immediate, perhaps even longed for. You know Judy, he said to Nat later, standing outside with her in the chilly early evening air while she smoked. She asked me when it was visiting time. Judy gets confused sometimes, said Nat. You know that. Yeah, I know. It's sad, though, he said, when they don't have anyone. I think she's lucky, said Nat. Contrariness was in her nature, so Christopher didn't flinch. I see the others with their relatives who come and visit and can't wait to get away. They sit there with nothing to say, staring at the television. Judy has all these people keeping her company, all her friends. We just can't see them, that's all. I think she's the least lonely out of all of us. She puffed out a cloud of cigarette smoke and steam. 
it joined the flakes of snow that were just beginning to fall. His shift having finished, Christopher thought about going for a walk or calling on a friend, but in the end he decided he was too tired for anything except bed. His room was on the same floor as Judy's, and passing her door, he was dimly aware of music playing from within. Old-time music, and a voice, or voices, speaking. It was recalling her earlier remark about visitors that made him stop in his tracks. Stop and listen. He couldn't be sure, but it sounded like Judy was talking to another woman. A younger woman, possibly. And then Judy sounded different too. Younger herself. He suddenly realised that he knew very little about the old woman. Had she a daughter, or, or a younger sister? Bloody liberty, if you ask me. The voice came so suddenly that Christopher started. He reeled around to see Les standing in his own doorway next door to Judy's room. He was wearing a somewhat vexed expression and a flamboyant dressing gown in turquoise and paisley. I can't hear the TV with all her carrying on in there, he complained. I ought to get a discount having her as a neighbour. She seems harmless enough to me, said Christopher. Has she got someone in there? The old man leaned in conspiratorially, and Christopher was aware of a scent. There's his aftershave that took him back to childhood. Two barber shops he'd been taken to by his granddad. It was not an unappealing smell. Spicy, vaguely citrusy. But the old boy must have bathed in it, bless him. I'll tell you something about that one, he grumbled. The Doolally thing's an act. You think she's away with the fairies, but she's taking everything in. She said things to people in here that she's got no right to know about. Gives you the creeps the way she looks at you sometimes. Christopher's bafflement must have shown on his face, because the old man continued. There's no one in there with her, he said, nodding at the door. So who is she talking to? Go in and see for yourself. He backed into his room, and while you're in there, tell her to keep the bloody noise down. Les banged his door shut, and Christopher allowed a few seconds to pass before knocking on Judy's. It isn't locked, she called out. You can come in. He turned the handle, pushed the door open, and went in, ducking under the frame as he always had to on entering rooms. He was immediately struck by the oddness of what confronted him. Judy? I thought I heard voices. Are you... alone? Clothes were strewn across the bed in a jumble. Had they not been transparently the garments of an elderly woman, the scene would have been more redolent of a teenage girl's bedroom than that of a pensioner. The occupant herself was presently sat at the dressing table. She was midway through the application of lipstick. As Christopher appeared in the mirror behind her, she stopped, the tube poised at the lower lip. She was wearing the kind of dress he'd seen in old photos and charity shop windows. A red and white polka dot creation, with a skirt that puffed out around her bony legs. Oh, I'm never alone, she said. Taffeta rustled as she twisted to face him. I'm playing chaperone tonight, with Brenda and her gentleman friend, at the dance. Her eyes closed slowly, lashes heavy with mascara clumsily applied. How do I look? Christopher did not immediately respond. He had never known Judy to wear makeup, and wondered where it had come from but observed that the lipstick tube was old and tarnished, the tip of the wax worn and crumbly, and that it had left a trail of red crumbs across the old woman's mouth. He doubted it was safe to use antique cosmetics, and gently extracted it from Judy's grit. I think you look lovely, he said diplomatically, and then, is Brenda here now? The music played on in the background, and Christopher had the curious sense of eavesdropping on a memory of having 
trespassed somehow. She's getting ready, said Julie. She's never been courting before. She's a bit nervous. So we're having a glass of sherry. She gestured to the chest of drawers as if he should see the drinks. But there was nothing. Father would be cross if he knew. She said in a confidential tone. But I sneaked it out of the cabinet when he was out of the room. She giggled, and it was as if the old woman was a mischievous schoolgirl. He turned and went over to the table, his back to her. Do you mind if I turn the music down, Judy? He asked. His finger was already on the volume control of the tape machine. Judy? He started. The voice was unexpectedly close behind him. Who's Judy? She asked. She had evidently followed him across the room, silent as a ghost. I'm Margaret, she said, like the Queen's sister, but you can call me Peggy. Everybody else does. Not for the first time since he had known her and the others like her, Christopher wondered what it must be like to be in the old girl's head, to live among that muddle of names and places, and have so tenuous a grasp of reality yet such vivid interactions with the past. She held out a hand, and he shook it gently. His big hand enclosing her frail fingers felt like holding a newly hatched bird, tiny boned and trembling. Do you smoke? she asked him. No, he replied, adding, neither do you. I shouldn't, I know, but it does help with nerves. I've got butterflies. I'm going to a dance tonight. Do you dance? <laughs> no, he said. Not so much these days. You should, she said. It's good for the spirit. He left her soon after. Left her to her reminiscences. Or whatever they were. But something had troubled him about the encounter something that nagged at him as he struggled to sleep. It was not that there was anything out of the ordinary about Judy's behaviour, and she had episodes like that all the time. The out-of-the-ordinary thing was not her, but his experience of it. The next day he tried to explain as much to Nat, busy loading a trolley with jugs of water, tumblers and pill bottles, ready for the morning round of medication. It wasn't like it normally is, he insisted. It was different. You'll think I'm stupid, but it was almost like those other women were there in the room. Or had been. She swept a niggling stray strand of blonde hair back behind her ear and huffed. Do you know what I think? She said, and it was apparent from her tone that the answer would quickly follow. I think you've been spending so much time here that the crazy has rubbed off on you. Judy's not crazy he retorted. You're not meant to say that. She rolled her eyes at him. I'm not talking about her, she said. I mean all of this, sitting around waiting to die crazy. Them and us. Do you think this is where I thought I'd be growing up? Is it where you wanted to be? Christopher frowned. He didn't like it when Nat talked that way. It reminded him of arguments with Bev. He knew the words were intended to challenge, to spur into action, to reach out to some slumbering part of himself. But they always had the opposite effect of merely magnifying his feeling of disillusionment. Sensing this, Nat softened. Look, she said, all I meant to say was that maybe you're working too hard. You're a young-ish guy, she made a face and shrugged in a way that made Christopher laugh. You're sweet, strong, kind, good-looking. I just think maybe you should try and have a little fun for once. She started off with the trolley. And with someone your own age, not the old lady, she added, without looking back. It was dark outside when he went to check on Judy. The flurry of snow the previous day had not lasted long enough to settle, and today had brought only a persistent downpour of sleet. Some of the residents chose to eat with others in the communal dining room, others in their rooms. 
Some were not given the choice. Judy was meant to eat downstairs where she could be watched, but she had not materialised so far. Before he even knocked, he heard sobbing from within. This was not an uncommon occurrence. Residents would get emotional, and some were regularly confused and distressed to the point of weeping and wailing. He had known Judy to become tearful before, but this sounded alarmingly different. Raw. Judy? He said, knocking. Judy? Is everything all right? As he tried the door and it opened, he heard Lair's next door call out. Tell the old witch to bloody shut up, will you? I'm trying to watch Countdown. Can't get a minute's peace in this place. All right, said Christopher firmly. That's enough, Mr. Peacock. He went in and was immediately struck by how cold the room was. Icy. Yet the radiator on the wall was hot to touch. Judy was not on the bed, but next to it, with the bed covers pulled around her. Judy, what's the matter? He wondered if she'd fallen or had become suddenly disoriented. He saw that she was shaking, shivering. He saw also that she must have been wearing mascara again. The tears running down her cheek were like spilt ink. He crouched at her side. He saw that she was wearing a flimsy nightdress and gently drew the covers around her. Judy, what happened? he asked. The words, when they came, came in short, choking bursts. I, sh I shouldn't have stayed, she said. Should have caught the bus. Should have stayed with Brenda. He knew at once this was memory again. I shouldn't have... I shouldn't have let her go on her own. But I thought he liked me. I didn't think... There, there, murmured Christopher. It's not real. It's just a memory. You're safe here, Judy. He called her Judy, but he felt he must be talking to Peggy. Was Peggy a name she used to be called? She was too lost in her thoughts to correct him this time. She... She had to go, see. He didn't want to be late home, but he said stay. It's all right. We're having fun, aren't we? I said we were. Brenda still wanted to go, and I told her, I told her not to be so boring. She got cross with me, and went. He said he was glad, because, because he liked me better anyway. Judy, shh, it's okay now. I should have gone with Brenda. I should have gone. Oh no. What must she think of me? What will they think of me? Christopher tried to soothe her, to calm her, but it was as if she was oblivious to his presence, or rather that she was no longer present herself. She was staring straight ahead, her eyes wide, unblinking, bloodshot. Finally, he called for Nat, and together they calmed her down, cleaned her up, helped her to dress, and eventually brought her downstairs for dinner. Christopher brought her a cup of tea, which she sipped, gazing absently at the evening news on the television. You feeling better now, Judy? He asked, as he passed her for the umpteenth time. She turned her head to the side and nodded cheerfully. It was, as always, as if nothing untoward had happened. Nat was busily clearing the detritus from dining tables, and Christopher stooped to pick up a fork she had dropped. Look at that, she said, gesturing at the TV screen. He looked up and saw a long line of people waiting in a line outside a big store in London. Some of them were sitting in deck chairs or cross-legged on the pavement. This is for toy. Where I come from, we used to queue like this for bread. Crazy! She went off, shaking her head leaving Christopher unsure whether he was supposed to be more incensed at the idea of queuing for bread or the idea of queuing for toys. 
As Christmas Day drew nearer, the lodge grew quieter. Some of the residents had already been whisked off to spend the season with family, and as the big day inched closer, more disappeared for shorter stays. Some would spend Christmas Eve, while others would be tolerated for a few hours on Christmas Day itself, and hurried back, it often seemed to Christopher, as early as it seemed proper to do. Others had no one, and for these residents the nut tree staff made a concerted effort to rouse some festive cheer. The children's carol concert was just one highlight in a programme of events that included a Christmas wreath-making session, led by a pair of bickering Scottish women, a greasy-haired keyboard player in a sequined suit, and an obese Vera Lynn impersonator. On the day before Christmas Eve, a local women's choir, less cherubic than the primary school lot, but rather better rehearsed, were due to perform, and seats had been rearranged in the lounge area to provide a good vantage point for those that wanted it. Christopher knew that Judy enjoyed the choirs, or seemed to, but when he went to escort her from her room, she was missing. Then it transpired that she had not been seen since lunchtime. The lounge spilled over into a large glass-windowed conservatory, providing a vista of the back garden. There was a light and steady snowfall outside, not enough to settle, but sufficient to dust the skeletal hedgerows and stoic shrubs like icing sugar on a cake. Christopher's inquiries after Judy's whereabouts led him to the conservatory, whereupon he was alerted by a hearty, Hey, big man! and finger point from Mr. McDaig. He saw that Judy was outside. She was at the far end of the garden, next to one of the benches, at the foot of the large atlas cedar that stood there, partially obscured by the droopiest of its lower branches. She was kneeling, as if in prayer, he thought, until he saw that she was also bent forward a little, and her hands were sweeping the ground before her, scrabbling in the soil of the flower beds. She wasn't wearing a coat. He rushed out to her. The frosted grass crunched under his heavy feet like broken baubles. When he reached her, he saw that she was panicked, desperate, frantically searching. Who was she now, he wondered. Judy or Peggy? Can you help me find it? She said. She left it here. Left what? He said, and tried, gently, to help her up. Come on, we need to get you inside. It's cold out here. Snowflakes were in her hair and on the pale blue cardigan she wore. Her tights and the hem of her skirt were wet and muddy from kneeling on the ground. The old woman went on. I saw her. She was putting something here, under a tree like this. She wants to find it. She needs to. What is it, Judy? He said. He was already leading her back to the lodge and to warmth. What do you think is there? This is 71 Harper Street, isn't it? She said. No, Judy, you're at the lodge, not Tree Lodge, where you live. What's at Harper Street? Is that where you used to live? Judy? Judy! And he had lost her again. He wasn't sure why he went there or what he could possibly hope to achieve. But that evening, by foot and bus and foot again, he found Harper Street. Of course, he could not be sure whether it was Judy's Harper Street, or just a Harper Street, but the fact of one existing a stone's throw from the lodge and having a number 71 on it was enough to persuade him to make the journey. The pavement was wet, shiny and each step of his path was illuminated by street lamps, headlights, and the silvers, reds, whites, blues, golds, and greens that twinkled in every handsomely decorated window. He supposed they were Georgian townhouses, and therefore hideously, prohibitively expensive nowadays. He wasn't sure whether they were back in Judy's day, but somehow he couldn't picture her ever having lived there. Once he was outside 71, he chided himself for embarking on such a fool's errand. What on earth was he hoping to find out? That she lived there once. That there was a tree, 
a cedar in the garden, and under it something connected to her past. He wasn't even sure these houses had gardens. They were so tall and narrow. Then London was full of surprises, and secret oases hidden from the public view. Originally, he had imagined himself ringing the doorbell and asking a simple question. Do you know of a woman who used to live here once, a long time ago? Her name was Judy, or maybe Margaret or Peggy. But standing there in front of the impressive building, with its windows emanating light and warmth, smells of good food, wine, chocolate, candles, almost perceivable through the glass, brick and plaster. Standing there, he realised it was ridiculous. He was ridiculous. Coming to this house, to solve a mystery that was probably nothing more than the confused rambling of a poor old woman. That was right, he reflected. He needed to spend less time at the lodge. He was still standing in front of number 71, when the door was opened cautiously and a middle-aged man, bundled into a rather snug-fitting Christmas jumper with a stag on it, peered out. The delicious aroma of mince pies and mulled wine wafted from within. Everything all right? the man asked, nervousness in his voice. The doorway was at the top of four shallow steps that led up from the pavement, but this only brought the man level with Christopher's eyeline. He noticed the curtain in the window twitch, and a woman's face the wife, perhaps, intrigued but anxious, briefly illuminated by blinking Christmas lights, treated into darkness. He understood. He was freakishly tall, solidly built, shabbily clothed, loitering in a way that suggested he was up to no good. A giant spectre at the feast, come to ruin Christmas. Yeah, sorry, wrong address, he said turning to go, but when he suddenly turned again and spoke, the householder nearly jumped out of his skin. Do you know if a lady called Judy ever lived here? he asked. The man made a face. Or Peggy she might have been. He made a gesture with his palms. Couldn't say, said the man. I only know we bought the house off of Mr. Sandu, or Sindhu, and his family. Trying to be helpful, he added. He was Indian. A dentist, I think. The woman, the same one who had been watching from the window, suddenly popped up behind the man's shoulder. An orthodontist, darling, she corrected. Oh, yes, I knew it was one or the other, said the man. Well, sorry we can't help you. He was about to close the door when Christopher spoke again. Wait, he said, and the woman of the house screamed. What is it? said the man. Do you have a big tree at the back, like a cedar tree? The man was evidently running through a series of responses and outcomes, because he allowed a few seconds to elapse before replying. Yes, an atlas cedar, he said rather ponderously, adding, if you're here to complain about the size of it, you can save your breath. I'm having it cut down in the new year. No, it's nothing like that, said Christopher. I just wondered... Have you ever found anything unusual in the garden? The words had left his lips before he realised they might sound odd, and the man's countenance left him in no doubt as to just how odd they sounded, for he was now eyeing him warily whilst backing into the house. No, I can't say we have, said the man. Well, good evening to you. Merry Christmas. Christopher awoke the next day, feeling as tired as if he had not slept at all. After leaving number 71, he had found himself short of bus fare, and made the whole of the journey back to Nutry by foot. It was late when he finally, gratefully, climbed into bed. But even then he had been restless. His mind troubled. His body unable to find comfort in the bed that was too small for him and whose vicious mattress springs poked and prodded in all the wrong places. As he struggled to sleep, he pondered on the wretched state of his life, and it only accentuated the physical discomfort this giant felt, being contained in a too small bed, in a too small room, 
which still had enough space around the sides to fit his life's possessions into. He ached for childhood, to return to a time when he still had to stretch to reach the end of the bed. He yearned for the Christmas stocking he would find there in the small hours of Christmas morning, pined for the magic and mystery of Christmases with Mum and Sister Jocelyn. At some point, when Mum died, the magic went, and the only mysteries left were Bev's mood swings and the hallucinations of an old woman. You look terrible, said Carla as he helped serve breakfast. I feel terrible, said Christopher. Later he brought Judy her tea and tablets. Hi, Judy, he said. She smiled at him. She seemed lucid in the here and now again. You're always here, aren't you? She said. Don't you have a home to go to? He chuckled. Not always here, he said. But at the moment, this is my home. Judy frowned. Surely not, she said. Where will you spend Christmas Day? Here, yeah, he said. I'll be able to put a crack with you tomorrow, won't I? And take your tablets. Is it Christmas Eve today? She asked. That's right. We're going to have bingo and a quiz later. Maybe a bit of a disco and a sing-song if you're up for it. He mimed some dance moves as he said it. Judy looked pensive. What's up? Hey, what's up? You like my dancing? He said. You said it was good for the spirit. Oh dear, she said suddenly. It's tonight then. What is? He asked. The visiting hours. The cup and saucer rattled in her hand again. He took them from her and set them on the table. What do you mean, Judy? He asked. Uh, coming. Tonight, she said, trembling. Who is? Who's they, Judy? She shook her head. Oh, dear, she said. Oh, God. Oh, dear God. Suddenly, Mr. Collier, sitting close by, looked up from a game of draughts and said, Better batten down the hatches, Sonny. There's a storm a-coming. Christopher looked at him curiously, and then realised he was referring to the weather forecast it was currently showing on the big television on the wall. As it happened, the storm arrived sooner than expected the wind whipping rain against the windows, the branches of the tall cedar swinging violently in the strong gusts that buffeted the lodge. Inside, the usual Christmas Eve diversions, the card games and charades and Christmas music, did their best to drown out the commotion without, but talk would circle back to the weather. A storm like this on Christmas Eve, almost unheard of. One resident speculated aloud that these were less than optimal conditions for reindeer flight, and several others announced that they wouldn't want to be climbing down chimneys on such a night as this. Eventually, they had either shuffled off to their rooms of their own accord, or been encouraged in that direction, and those unable to make that journey under their own steam had been duly escorted. Nat and a couple of other staff members were tidying up, putting the room back in some semblance of order, ready for it all to be disrupted again by the Christmas Day festivities. Christopher's shift had finished hours before, but short of anything better to do, he had been helping, and sitting chatting and playing games with the residents, all the while thinking about Judy and her talk of visiting hours. She had seemed genuinely frightened by something, and had gone off to bed in much the same agitated state she had been in earlier. "'Hey, where are you going with that?' asked Nat, as she clocked Christopher, heading towards the staircase, carrying one of the spare folding chairs under his arm. He looked faintly embarrassed, presumably having hoped no one would notice. "'I'm worried about Judy,' he said, and looked up the stairs." Nat walked over to him 
Still holding the party tablecloth, she was folding into a neat square. She'll be fine, said Ned. I've seen her like this before at Christmas. She's just confused. No, insisted Christopher. This is different. She seemed really scared now. You didn't see her. She thinks someone, something, is coming for her. And it can't get to her here, said Nat. She's safe. He was about to protest. To tell her that he couldn't explain it, but that he had an uneasy feeling. A sense of some impending tragedy that had been approaching, drawing ever nearer since Judy first mentioned the visiting hours. Something in her manner, in her eyes, the terror in her voice hinted that this was more than just memory or fantasy. Something real. But before he could tell her, Nat spoke again. She's safe because you'll protect her, she said, smiling. Go, take up your post. I'll bring you some coffee. Some two hours later, the coffee having long since been drained, Christopher remained sitting in the folding chair that was too small for him, and whose armrests pinched his sides uncomfortably. He was stationed outside Judy's room, illuminated by the hall light which was kept on for the safety of any residents who might decide to wander in the night. He could hear the faint snores of sleepers, and the wind still howling outside, but otherwise all was silent. It was a silence he dreaded the breaking of. Nat had come up twice to see him, the first time with the coffee, the second time to wish him good night, and bring him a book from the home store of battered ex-library stock. He had frowned at her choice, a Christmas carol, and supposed it was Nat's idea of a joke. What? she said. This way you'll know what to do if you meet any ghosts. Christopher grinned. Until then, he hadn't even thought of Judy's visit as being ghosts. But if not ghosts, then what? Do you want me to keep you company? said Nat. The storm's really bad, so Pauline said I can use one of the spare rooms tonight. <laughs> she just wants to make sure you're on time for your shift tomorrow, said Christopher cynically. No, it's all right. You get some rest. By then it was nearly midnight, so Nat had wished him Merry Christmas, and disappeared. Now he sat in the chair in the hall, alert to every slight creak of floorboard or window frame, every dull clank of the pipework, the myriad strange sounds of a house at rest, or unrest, and every moan of the wind, the insistent tapping of the rain, the hiss of swaying leaves and the bone rattle of branches. With nothing to do but wait, his mind wandered. He thought of the record of his mum's that was lost. He thought of his sister and how she would be making the last minute preparations for Christmas with her children, his nephews, and how he wished they hadn't fallen out. He thought of Bev and how they'd made each other so unhappy. He thought of Nat, and how she made him laugh, even though she was cranky. He thought of Judy. And at some point, he fell asleep. He woke with a start, jolting forward in the chair. His heart was pounding. He was immediately aware of two things. Firstly, it was dark, almost pitch black, almost. The whole light was out, but there was still a small red light showing on the security camera. Secondly, it was icy cold, freezing like it had been the other day in Judy's room when... Judy! He tried her door and found it locked. 
He had remembered to bring up her spare room key from the office, and fumbling in the darkness managed to find the keyhole to let himself in. Tumbling through the doorway, he found himself, if it were possible, in an even blacker space, moonlight having been blocked by the thick, drawn curtains. So cold. He felt goose flesh crawl across his skin. At first he could make out nothing in the room. No shapes, no indication of life, save for a low murmuring sounded mere inches away. He put out his hands and immediately touched something that made him recoil. Bare skin. Gold. Almost paper thin. He stepped backwards. He felt for the light switch and found it instantly, but flicking it was useless. The bulb had gone, or maybe all the lights were out. The handiwork of the storm, perhaps. Redundantly, he tried the switch again. He was aware of movement. Of another vague sound. The sound of fingers moving across paper. The figure was close. And moving its hands across the wall. The voice, still faint, became more audible. I should have gone with her. See, I shouldn't have stayed. It was Judy, speaking as he had found her on that previous occasion. The voice seemed even more dislocated, as if the words were merely being transmitted. A younger woman's story, being told by a much older one. It suddenly dawned on him that this was a confession. An expiation of some kind. A catharsis. And he was meant to listen. To let Judy, or Peggy, or whoever she was, speak. I shouldn't have stayed. But I was enjoying it. The attention. The music. The drinks. The way he looked at me. He said... He knew a pretty walk home. I didn't realise how tipsy I was until I stood up and he took me out of my way in the wrong direction. Took me where there were trees and the ground was damp. Wet leaves. I said, I didn't like it. I wanted to go home. I asked him to take me home. He said, it was wrong of me. You shouldn't lead him up the garden path like that. Let him pay for drinks all night. And when I tried to walk away, he caught me by the arm. And then, it all happened so fast. I couldn't get away. I tried to fight him off. But he was too strong. It was all over me. Oh God. I can still remember. The alcohol. On his breath. His rough hands. The smell of his. Aftershave was. Overpowering. That smell. What do they call that stuff? Bay rum. Bay rum. A lightning bolt flashed across Christopher's brain as he suddenly thought of the old man in the next room. He shot back through the door and into the hallway, making for Les's room. But instead, he collided with something that stopped him in his tracks. He gasped, shuddered. His hands grabbed at something, not quite solid, but nevertheless tangible. An entity somehow inexplicably darker than the darkness that surrounded him. It was not the only such entity, either. He knew instantly that the black hallway teemed with these creatures, that he was in their midst, 
and that although they seemed oblivious to his presence, he could not risk underestimating the extent of their malignity. Who are you? he stuttered. What are you? His cry seemed to draw their attention. He felt their hands on him. The sensation of long, impossibly gnarled fingers crawling over him. The wind that had howled outside now seemed to howl through them. He felt grim tendrils of spiderweb hair caress his face, and every breath he drew tasted of earth and ash and rotten wood. The light came on. Temporarily, Christopher was dazzled, and then blinking. He saw that the creatures had vanished as suddenly as the light had arrived. He heard footsteps bounding up the staircase, and Nat's voice followed. Are you okay? She panted. She was carrying a torch. Yeah, he said. I, I think so. The electricity went off. Something tripped a fuse. I, I had to reset it. She paused. Jesus, you look like you've seen a go- Have you got your room keys? He interrupted, trying Les's door to no avail. No, I- Les! He called out. Mr. Peacock! Are you alright in there? Christopher, what's wrong? What's going on? He didn't answer. He barged the door with his shoulder instead, and its hinges broke away from the frame at the very first attempt. He managed to catch the door before it fell and leant it against the wall outside. Without it, the door frame made the perfect surround for the macabre picture that now confronted them. In the room, in darkness, but partially illuminated by the glaring hall light, the body of Les Peacock was suspended above the carpet. The long cord of his turquoise dressing gown was wrapped around his neck and tied to the white flecks of the overhanging lamp. The weight of his body had put a crack in the ceiling and the rose had come away, with the shade now sitting cock-eyed, giving the absurd appearance of a hat worn at a jaunty angle. The old man's tongue protruded, his eyes bulged, had he not been dead, his vanity would not have permitted the dressing gown to gape and reveal the pale, hairy chest and swollen belly, nor would it have let the toupee slip to reveal the bald head. The thing on the carpet that Nat initially took for a rat was Les's wig, studded with glass from the shattered bulb and dusted with plaster. The body twisted in the breeze, even though there wasn't one. Death, in a home for the elderly, is so commonplace an occurrence that staff and residents are inured to it. Nevertheless, the circumstances of Les Peacock's demise disrupted breakfast and threatened to disrupt Christmas altogether. Suicide by hanging seemed the obvious explanation, although no one could offer any reason why he might kill himself. The police, when they arrived, seemed more concerned about the how than the why. There was no overturned chair or stool in the room that Les could have stepped on in order to step off, and they seemed doubtful that the old man was gymnastic enough to use the edge of his bed as a launch pad, although they agreed it was technically possible. They might have supposed he had been helped to hang himself, or led to suspect foul play, but footage from the security camera in the hall showed that no one had come in or out of Les's room that night, apart from Les himself. It also caught every second of Christopher's lonely vigil outside Judy's room, including the part when the lights went out, and he was shown stumbling into Judy's room and then back out into the hall, when static interference briefly affected the playback, and then the part when the light came back on, and Nat showed up, and how they found the dead man together. This was enough to prompt questions, but Christopher told them the truth. He told them about Judy, Brenda, Peggy. 
he told them about the story he had heard from Judy's lips, and why he had thought of Les, and his experience in the hallway. And at that, the police, if not entirely satisfied, seemed inclined to leave it. They think you're crazy, said Nat later, dressed in green, red and white, as a Christmas elf. You said as much yourself the other day, grinned Christopher. What are those? He had noticed she was wearing little furry Christmas pudding earrings. Do you like them? She said, flicking one. It played a tinny electronic rendition of We Wish You a Merry Christmas. I think they rather suit me. He looked at the funny little elf with her candy-striped stockings and jingling green hat. I thought you hated Christmas and all that, he said. She looked back at him in disbelief. Why would you say that? She said. My name literally means Christmas. Natalia. It was funny, he thought. The mysteries that come into one's life. The revelations. Here was another. A penny had dropped. Natalia. Nat. His friend. Was. Beautiful. Anyway, big man. Don't forget you're down to play Santa Claus later. Get your costume on. It is difficult to find clothes that fit you when you're six foot eight. It is twice as difficult to find Father Christmas costumes. But Christopher duly played his part. He would normally have dressed up to distribute small gifts in the morning, but the schedule had been set back by the business with Les. It was now late in the afternoon, and the Christmas meal had been served, consumed, if not fully digested, and cleared away. Everyone agreed that the delays had improved rather than been to the detriment of Carla's roast potatoes and gravy. The television was showing the news, detailing the carnage caused by the previous night's storm. It had brought down a big cedar tree in the garden of a house in London, and the owners had found a box caught up in the fallen tree's enormous roots. The caption and subtitles on the screen said that Human remains had been found in the box under the tree at the house. On Harper Street. The bones of a baby, wrapped in the remnants of swaddling clothes and newspaper from 1952. Whoever was being interviewed said that there would be an investigation, but it was hoped that the child would now receive a proper Christian burial. If Judy was paying attention to what was on the screen, Christopher couldn't tell. She was gazing, she often did, into the far off somewhere. Present from Santa, said Christopher, sitting down next to her. Don't get too excited, he said, in a confidential tone. It's just pound shop tap. She seemed to come alive at the sound of his voice. I'm sorry, I was miles away, she said. I must have had a bit of a broken sleep last night. I think we all did, said Christopher. I've got something for you as it happens, she said, and began rooting around in the large bag between her legs under the table. He pulled the fake white beard down under his chin while he waited for her to re-emerge. When she did, she was holding something in brightly patterned gift wrap. You've been very kind to me, Christopher, she said. And I thought it was about time someone showed you some kindness. She made to hand the package to him, but pulled it away before he could take it. One thing, she said, the kindly twinkle in her eye. Your sister misses you. Go and see her. He looked at her quizzically, and then she handed him the present. A perfect square in wrapping paper, which he began opening carefully, and then tore frantically. How? He began. Questions like, how did you know, and how did you find it, 
formed in his mind. But he decided it was better not to know. Christmas was a time, after all, for magic and mysteries. Thank you, Judy, he said. Please, call me Jude, the old woman replied. Everyone else does. He cradled the record in his hands, the familiar album sleeve, showing a man in check trousers and lurid shirt, sitting on a throne in front of a rather ostentatious mantelpiece. Rather silly album cover, truth be told, but undoubtedly the same sleeve, the exact same sleeve as the one his mother had first bought at that Brixton record shop all those years ago. This one bore the same slight tears in the top right and bottom right corner, the same coffee stain, the same faint imprints where she had leant on it to write love letters, shopping lists. And he knew that when he played it, he would hear the same crackle and the same scratches in the same places, and that he would be transported to those Sunday mornings dancing with her in the kitchen as the sunlight streamed through, remembering the smell of her apron, the warmth of her, the sweet sound of her voice as she tried to sing along. <laughs> Thank you, Jude he said, and happy Christmas. She said nothing, and when he looked up, she was smiling, a peaceful, contented smile. It's like one he'd seen before. If you enjoy the show, why not become a patron on Patreon and gain access to exclusive content? It's the surest way to help me keep creating. You can also buy me a coffee, like, subscribe, comment, share, follow on social media, and read the description for more information about the show and how you can engage with it. Until next time, sweet dreams.